I know the best way to wake everybody up is to talk about databases again. Yay! Nothing more exciting. Um, again, I touched on it earlier. If you're going to optimize when you get a lot of records or you run into uh, performance issues, it helps to know a lot about relational databases, what they do well. I love relational databases. Um, one of the things that they do extremely well is working with general set operations with large numbers of records. If you're going to do that in code, um, you're going to be iterating through things. It's non-native code. Um, databases have been written to optimize that. They've been written to optimize it using different strategies sometimes based on uh, what you're doing with the data. Most times they're going to get better than what I'm going to be able to do. Um, they sort very, very well on integer indexes, millions of records. They can handle the joins and, and so forth extremely well with the indexes that they use. Sorting, filtering, the same thing. Um, whenever you use a where clause in pods, you're handing away the filter to the database and the database engine handles that. You don't have to handle that in code. Um, joining the tables, all that. And aggregating. Uh, you start getting data, you're eventually going to want averages, you're going to want sums. You don't want to loop through a thousand records and add them together, divide by a thousand. Uh, the database engine can do that and it does it extremely well and extremely efficiently. So I love relational databases. Um, I also hate <laughs> relational databases. <laughs> <laughs> They're not well suited to everything. Um, repeated calls to the database engine is very, very inefficient. You should think of it like you're driving across town. If you're going to go across town to pick up one item, you don't want to do that and come home and then go get another item across town. You want to get everything in one trip. And if you're going to go to the database engine, you want to try and do that. If you're getting a large record set, again, it depends on if you have eight records, it's probably not a big deal. Um, pods by default, when you uh, pull things through fine, does not just arbitrarily deep descend into your relationships. Um, you may have a player pod, you've got people's names, that's then related to the team's pod. And you may be in multiple teams, so it could join that. And then the teams may have uh, the sponsors. And then it could jump into there and pick those up. And there may be multiples. And maybe that has a relationship to sponsor levels. Pods can't just go grab all that data. You may not need all that. And that can be inefficient. Um, however, if you do need extra information that's one or two levels deep, um, Going and getting all the IDs from the first table and then looping through those and getting the other one. Now you're going, if it's 100 records, now you're going to 101 queries running because you get that first result and now you're looping through those 100 records and getting 100 more relationships. God forbid you have to do 100 more <laughs> off of each one of those. So there are things you can do to optimize that. Um, you can tweak the, the select uh, parameter of pods to help. If you're if you're a SQL jock and you really know your way around SQL, um, you can tweak the, the select to pick which fields you want, including you know uh, how, what the joins are. If you know how pods creates the joins, you can select all those fields up front. So you can get everything in one query and come back. And it make the difference of a factor of ten on things. If something takes twenty seconds to do it slowly and iterating through PHP, you can probably grab it two seconds straight. From and uh, synchronization, uh, nothing has aged me more in the past five years than trying to keep a dev and a live database <laughs> in sync. <laughs> Once this one's going forward and this one's going forward in a different way and now we need to weave them together. Um, they don't do that very, very well. I, I have grown to love source control again uh, after trying to synchronize databases. I've learned to, <laughs> to really enjoy uh, source control a whole lot better. Um, and one other thing, this doesn't normally come into play, but writes are a fair bit more expensive than reads on uh, database access. There's a lot of housekeeping things that have to go on. It keeps an index that makes it quick to go look things up, quick to filter things, um, but it has to update those every time that it makes inserts into the database so that it has those. You can do that work up front so when you do your reads, things are faster. Um, that starts to slow down when you get a million records and certain hundred more is a whole lot slower than if you have a thousand records and inserting a hundred. Um, all the involved index columns have to be updated. They have integrity rules and other things in the database to make sure that nothing gets out of sync. 
So the time needed to update on each successive record. And again, when you get a, a few hundred thousand records, you can start to see that making an impact. Um, not generally a day-to-day -day issue that most people run into, but if you're doing large imports, um, Cheryl knows this, <laughs> yes. they, they can take some time. And there, there's some considerations that need to be involved in that. And large imports, sometimes there's just no two ways about it. I mean, when you're going direct SQL, that's about as fast as you're going to get. But uh, there are ways that you can you know, do that in chunks and, and show uh, display a, a progress meter so that you can at least see that the progress is going. If you're doing a big import, it's not a daily thing that you need to do. If it takes 10, 15 minutes, that's fine as long as it completes, if it completes correctly. So. Probably hand that one over to you. All right. So optimizing your site. Um, so once you've got your tweaks in mind, how you're going to do all the data handling, um, optimizing your site is the next step. Of course, when you're layering all these things together, um, you want to make sure your site is built correctly, you're storing your data in the correct way. But on top of that, you can optimize it further. So uh, object caching, we've talked about and cache all the things. Uh, that's almost absolutely needed for most large sites. Um, you can also do page caching, uh, with WP total cache, but uh, if you need like an anonymous cache, uh, Cloudflare is a great solution. Uh, Cloudflare.com. Uh, it's basically an anonymous cache plus a bunch of other things to help make your site perform a little bit better. And yes, and also some pretty cool security tools as well. Uh, you can also serve your files through a CDN like Mac CDN. Uh, so if you have really large files or uh, lots of media, uh, that can really help th send things out faster. Especially if you have a lot of visitors from Asia, but your server is located in Dallas. So if that's the, the case, then having a CDN will exponentially make that load a lot quicker. Um, for, for instance, if someone's living in Australia, they're going to have a really slow connection to the States. So um, it, if you have a CDN in Australia and it's already replicated there, they don't have to go across the ocean. So it's uh, it can really make things easier, depending on where your user base is. Uh, a lot of people are running US-based sites, so it's not as big of a consideration. but uh, for our site, we have Mac CDN set up, we have Cloudflare, uh, object caching, everything to the max. Um, we're also using SiteGround for our hosting, but uh, there are some pretty good usage, uh, some, some good hosts out there like SiteGround, WP Engine, that uh, provide a pretty good caching stack to be able to use. But uh, so, when you optimize your site, now you've got to start thinking about how you can optimize your workflow, because once you start doing all that, it starts getting more complex. Um, so you've got your, all, all your data, you've got all that stuff, and say, if you really want to do it the right way, um, DM, uh, you really want to be using something like Git for version control, um, Git branching uh, for Git flow branching. Um, basically, if anyone's familiar with Git, you can create branches, and basically you have multiple branches going on with lots of different features and fixes, and they all can be merged in together. But inside of that insanity, this flow model Makes sense of all of that craziness, and I'll go over it here in a second. But um, it's it's extremely useful, especially with the stuff I do in Tenel. Uh, recently had a really large project with lots of pain, uh, with multiple rep uh, repositories, uh, branching, uh, multiple people going to the code, the same files, uh, changing things around. So having a Gitful uh, solution was really integral to making sure I got out of that. <laughs> um, production. If you're working on a production site, you can calculate code, of course, but um, the right way to do it is, is to have production server, um, a staging server, and a local server. Something you can say, okay, on local, I can do whatever I want. On staging, I can test to make sure what I did works on the same as production. So usually you have a staging server and a production server that are very similar. Um, having a site like SiteGround gives you a dev site right away. Um, they have a staging area. WP Engine has a staging area as well. Both are extremely useful when you want to test code pushes. Um, and then local, um, Phil is addicted to local like I am, and you know, we like to make sure that we're, we're not messing with the server, not having to upload things every single time. Uh, and that can significantly help us, especially, especially when you want to do debugging. And it's really hard to do debugging if you don't have um, something called X debug. And that is a huge thing for local development where you can find out why is this taking so dang long? It's taking 10 minutes to load this page. Where is all loading? And you can find that out. You can also use tools like, just recently used it, sorry. Uh, it, it's, it can cost a lot of money to use those sort of tools that are remote. 
Um, so that's why having a local server is really helpful. Um, to run a local server, you might want to consider using very vagrant vagrants. Uh, it's something we developed at Tenup, but uh, it's it's got really high usage amongst most WordPress developers. Uh, even if it's even if they're not using our version of it, it vagrant is a big thing for us developers to make sure that we can run a local server that's as close as possible to a production environment in terms of configuration and how it's going to work and how it's going to act with uh, live, live code. So why would you use Git? It's easy to roll back when things don't work and that happens often. Um, it, I can tell you throughout my development through, with any one of my friends and family, I have one family member, uh, and uh, my coworkers that Stuff will happen almost every day, and you need a way to back that up. Uh, and, and one of the most easiest way to do that is to commit often. If you commit often with good status messages, you can basically, if you find out where you messed up, you can just subtract that commit from all the history, and you just take that out, and all of a sudden, it's as if that never existed, and everything else works perfectly fine. So that could be really useful, and you don't have to roll back to a date like um, if you would see in a normal backup restore solution. So you would have your multiple backups, and then you say, well, I knew it worked at that day, I can go back to it, but you lose all the stuff you did completely un unrelated to that. Thing. So that's a really great use for uh, Git workflow. Now, Git flow is a really cool thing. I, I'm a, we'll have the slide share up shortly, uh, or maybe already online, um, but here's a link right here. This is a great branching model. It's, it is hard to wrap your head around because it is so it, is, it, is, it could get really complex. As you see here, uh, we have our versions, version releases. Now, let's say someone says, oh, uh, when you upgrade, the whole site crashes. I go fix my stuff in here, and I push it into the next version. But, so these, this is your master line in your Git. This is what is on production. This is your develop, which is on uh, usually staging, uh, local. But you have your release and hotfix branches here which you can push other things into. It's a, it can be, like I said, it can be very complex, but the, the, ma the main goal of it is to separate things out. So, for instance, on this project, I'll make it a lot more simple. On the project I just used it on, I had to do um, ticket-based work. So, there would be a ticket where there was an issue, and I'd call all my fixes, hotfix slash um, whatever the name of the, the project is, dash the ID of the issue. And that significantly helped me because I was working on 10, 12 tickets all at once, and I would have to wait for someone to test it on their side. I have to wait to get an approval, and then I can push that to production. But in the meantime, I can work on something else, and I won't have to worry about whatever I just did over here messing up over here. And so I won't get a problem where I push something out that shouldn't have ever been touching a production server. So especially when you're working with multiple team members, um, this could be really useful. Um, with Cloudflare, uh, there's the URL right there. Uh, you get the anonymous page cache for your site. It's up whether your site is slow or down. Um, of course, they do have a, uh, an asterisk there saying not, they don't cache every single page of your site. They only cache the most used uh, pages. So even if your site does go down, there is a chance that it might uh, not be displayed properly. Uh, there are enterprise level plans and a higher one to have more availability. Uh, but speed, they speed up assets and automatically minifies your JavaScript and CSS. And that's pretty useful because you don't have to worry about doing that every time on your, your own development workflow, though I would recommend it, uh, having some sort of uh, chef script that runs and op optimizes all your stuff every time you do a push. Um, they also have a way that optimizes your images automatically for your assets. Uh, Rocket Loader for JavaScript will offload all of your external JavaScript until other assets like CSS load. So page loads, you're not waiting for JavaScript to ding, ding, ding and then your CSS finally appears. So um, that could be helpful uh, if you're, it's, a, it's sort of an out-of-box solution, but you can implement stuff that will fix that, but if you don't have the ability to, that can really help you. Uh, it also has IPv6 support, and speedy support, so that can really um, help speed up your site and, and make it available to others who are on different net network types. Uh, Max CDN files can be offloaded to another server which serves them up faster. Um, spread across the world. Like usually MaxCDN has a number of data centers all across the world that your, your images are now available for. Uh, so one, once someone loads it, it proliferates all the way through the network and that's uh, very valuable like I said earlier. 
someone coming from Australia can really be in, in a bit of a pain just to get your data from a U.S. data center. So is that something that you can integrate with a, a plugin or something to where when someone uploads something into the media yep. library and automatically it back to you? Yeah, there are a number of plugins that do it. Um, of course, probably the most well-known one is W3 Total Cache. They have a CDN. Um, they even have a Mac CDN option where it just sort of guides you through it and helps you create the zones and everything. All you have to do is have an actual account. Yeah. It should be able to help you walk through it. What about all site grounds? Does the site ground preclude you from using them? No, that would be the B engine. Um, SiteGround allows you to use it. Uh, it can actually enhance somewhat because their SuperCacher plugin is, uh, it does it only does a couple of those things. It doesn't do all the extra stuff that the Total Cache does. So what we use on pods is we actually don't use some of those things that the SuperCacher does, but we use the rest of the stuff. Um, and then, uh, actually, uh, WT Total Cache does have an extension for PodFlare, so you just enable it. Type in your Podflare key, and there it is. It knows to tell it to, to update things, and uh, it can help update some of your configuration. Um, hosting. Uh, SiteGround is a sponsor, of course, but uh, we're actually using SiteGround right now, and it's um, it's a great host so far. Uh, I used to use cPanel back in the day when I did reselling. I had a hosting company that I ran with, with about 150 sites, um, and it was not so much, not really fun. <laughs> um, mainly because I had to deal with customers, and the customers would be all walks of life. Mostly people who didn't know what websites were, they had had someone help them. But um, it was just a lot of work. But I hadn't touched cPanel since I went away from HostGator a number of years ago. And I went to uh, build my own server, and then I went to WP Engine. And I came back to SiteGround, I saw this cPanel implementation, and they've customized it pretty well. It's got a really great um, WordPress oriented um, set of functionality that they have built. They also have things that are Joomla and Drupal oriented, but um, coming from the WordPress side, it's pretty solid. Uh, so I'm going to drink of water. So they offer memcaching, page caching also, and built in Git for the site itself. So you can actually commit all your code up to your hosting site. And it's like an external Git repository, so you don't have to have a local one, you have to have one GitHub. So that's pretty useful. So in the case of another project I recently did, um, we had a dev site and we had a production site. What I did was I, I set up a Git repository for each. And what I did was I on my local, I had both of those remotes checked out. And I had one labeled as production and one labeled as dev. And what I could do is when I'm done committing to my dev site, I push it up to dev. Uh, and I can switch branches because I have locally, you can have remote branches as many as you want locally. And so I had one local branch called production and one local branch called dev. And each of those were linked to the corresponding remote. So I could switch to dev, do my code, push it up, works. I just merge or actually you can cherry pick over your commits into production, push, it's on production now. So it can really help out your workflow, especially in a, a site like the engineer site ground, we have um, the availability of Git uh, to really separate things out and keep it clean. Um, and you know, when we had things to go wrong, we could break those things out and push it back to dev and find out what went wrong. And so it's it's pretty easy. Um, and also, the WP Engine just came out with a new thing in the labs. It's really cool. It's called detailed caching. You can actually group your cache. Um, into different segments. So you can say, people from this country get this cache, people from this uh, browser get this cache, people from, uh, yeah, so many options, pretty cool. But it's in the lab, so it's not available publicly to every single uh, customer. But it's, it's something I keep my eye on, because as a previous WP Engine user, um, that would have been really excellent to have. Um, my, the, the thing that precluded me from using WP Engine ended up being WP CLI, we needed that for our pods documentation, for the new documentation system we're building. Um, and cPanel give us, gives us access to um, a lot of other things that are pretty cool, but it was mainly WP CLI that was the, uh, the main changer for us. And uh, WP Engine just doesn't have uh, terminal, sorry, it uh, doesn't have uh, <coughs> SSH available, so you can't really just connect to the site and type in commands. But uh, SiteGround does have that option. It's immensely helpful for what we do, especially when working with a lot of files and 
what you want to perform commands because the WP engine will do that for you as support, but I don't like to depend on someone else when I can have a command I know will work. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that's the optimization of your workflow. But uh, does anyone have any questions about any of those sort of services? I can also log into any of those accounts and let you see some of it. I have a question about SiteGround. It says you can give them free accounts. Yep. Do you What's the details of that? Uh, well, you, they own your life. Um, <laughs> for, for at least for 10 years. Uh, but, uh, no, I don't, I don't actually know what the details are of the individual uh, giveaway for this one. Uh, I do know that it's free for a year. Cancel any time. Uh, it's not going to build your card unless you willingly keep the service. So, um, so I did, I don't know if it's exactly the same offer, but I picked up one of their cards in WordCamp a little over a year ago, and it was choose any of the shared plans. Their shared is really above what you think of shared. And then uh, and they sent me a message saying, in a month, we're gonna, we need, you need to start paying for this, and I'm gladly paying for it, but I had the opportunity to scale up or scale down from there. So there wasn't any credit card up front, and it was it, choose one of their shared level plans and just go for a year. I want to make a comment on SiteGround because they have the most amazing customer service ever. And they're available 24 7. They're, and you they're call them, they'll call you back in 10 minutes. Or if you send a request for the support, they will email you back in 10 minutes with somebody who knows how to help and knows what to do. It's unbelievable. They're really good, at, and almost every time I've contacted them, it's been user error. Like it's been my fault, and they've like really been very helpful to me in did fixing my own fault this day. I mean, even if it is something on their thing, they're also yeah. super helpful with reporting that to an upper level yeah. and getting it fixed immediately. They're, they're amazing. The yeah. one time you need that or the first time you need it, it already pays for itself. Yeah, it absolutely. It's, I've had other experiences with other They're complimentary, I would say, because MaxCDN, in the way that I'm recommending you using it, is, is only for like files. Um, whereas Cloudflare will actually, you can have Cloudflare handle your, your content traffic, and so it could function like MaxCDN, but you don't get all of the CDN specific things, like um, MaxCDN offers for the additional locations, uh, more reach, more uh, power for as a CDN itself for file delivery. What, they, what CloudFront specializes in is, is primarily displaying a web page as quick as possible in assets. And they do some of the things that are sort of well-rounded, but I've, I always felt that after digging into it, actually it performed better as a CDN, uh, specifically. It sounds like you have bigger No, no, because MaxCDN, uh, in this implementation for our pod site, uh, we use a, uh, I used to I set up a custom C name, like cdn.pods.io. But uh, it could have been whatever and um, in that case, all those URLs aren't ever touched by Cloudflare because Cloudflare is a DNS thing. So you, you set your name servers to their DNS. You can manage your DNS records here on Cloudflare, and uh, they only do the, the the records that you choose to turn on. So let me show you that real quick. That's right here. So I can say um, I want the main pod site to be on. I want the code site to be on, but I don't want to. Um, you know, link on, or I don't want uh, whatever other records you may have. So, can you show the uh, uh, W3 total cache settings? What parts are you Can we show that up? Yeah. yeah. Also, wanted to show that uh, so SiteGround has this uh, multiple level caching available. So, you have Varnish static cache, which is even we, we, we have layer layer on right now with CloudFront, sorry, CloudFlare, um, MaxCDN. Varnish static cache, Varnish dynamic cache, and memcache. So we may have too much stuff on, but I found that I push as much as I could to the limit just to see if it would work, and it does. Um, but uh, they also have uh, this SG Git thing where we have two of our sites set up here. Um, that same sort of a similar setup where we have staging and we have a main site. And then they have um, auto updates available, which is it comes with WordPress by default, but you have the option to update your plugins as well. So that's pretty useful. So when 4.1 comes out, uh, your plugins can actually be updated as well, so that when your WordPress is updated, 
which said his break is a plug was, was uh, an older version and is no longer supported by 4.1 or whatever. So that's a pretty useful thing there. Good to, uh, to say. You can show us your password? No. <laughs> so, yeah, so our setup right now. Um, uh, we don't have page cache turned on. We don't have database cache turned on. And, and of course, if you're going to have database cache turned on, it's only you should consider only turning that on if you do not have object cache turned on, because that can complicate some things. Um, we don't have object cache turned on within the total cache. Like I said, super cache is handling that for us in the individual sites. Um, you can't see that here. And then um, what we have is a CDN setup. So we have we're using Max CDN. And uh, we're using uh, Cloudflare as well. I'm not going to show the key there. <laughs> How does all of these caching tools that we have running at the same time play with Varnish? And as a personal question, what do you think about Varnish caching? Uh, I like Varnish, Varnish caching. That's what we set up for WP Engine. Uh, WP Engine is actually running on Varnish as well. Um, well maybe, maybe Nginx uh, reverse proxy, but they're using a similar sort of setup. Was that? It's very yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I like Varnish. Um, how do they play well together? Max CDN, whenever I upload a file, it goes straight up there. If I need to refresh something, I can click a button here in uh, a pod site. Uh, Cloudflare, we only really have to clear anything on Cloudflare or really any of the sites if. <coughs> Sorry, I'm talking too much. Only ever have to clear anything if we're doing a significant push. And that's something you probably do anyways. Uh, you would just clear your cache. In this case, when you empty all caches, I believe uh, the control cache will send out something to Cloudflare saying, hey, merge. Uh, but it's, it's a simple button to click away. And then, uh, so really, you may click twice uh, on any significant push where you're changing some major theme files that aren't on the version line or anything else like that. Um, but it's not really difficult at all. Uh, it says of <coughs> premium WordPress hosting, are you limited to only using WordPress on the side program? No. Uh, they have WordPress specific hosting, but they also have Drupal specific hosting, and they also have Drupal specific hosting. Oh, I was just, it's I all the same account, though. I occasionally have to do a <coughs> PHP, you know, custom stuff, and so I'm curious about that. Yeah, yeah, it's all the same account. Um, And they have an auto installer, of course. Um, yeah, so you could just choose auto installer if you want. WordPress, G1. Um, well, they have the whole soft Acula somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right there. Right. right, so you could you could go cake PHP. I have everything else hidden. Oh, oh okay. So I was just worried because I have a, I have a client that, <coughs> for whatever reason, they decided WordPress was the people or something, and they they paid me a lot of money. To make and uh, <laughs> so I just I didn't know if it was limited just no. installing. No, if you can run anything you want. Anything that's okay. PHP, MySQL, you can probably install other things on the, the command line, if, possibly. I don't know if they have those commands available, but you could technically download whatever and run whatever. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically, if you've ever had cPanel posts, it's basically cPanel. Um, and that basically means you have to keep the URL, whatever. Uh, a host like WP Engine, technically you're not supposed to put anything else other than the WordPress site on that. Um, they won't let you create new databases, they won't let you create new users, so you are very restricted. It's got to be WordPress only. So I use WP Engine, I think, for that. Yeah. Now, there's ways to get around, of course, and that's, that's happened, but um, that's just when you want multiple sites and you want to get support for them, this is certainly a, a really good solution. Any other questions before I move on to undercover functions? All right.